please look at the code snippets in my most recent what, what book, um, Machine Learning for Asset wow. Managers. It came out uh, a, a month ago, um, and you, it was published by Cambridge University Press. You Coming can to the tail uh, end of download it. You know, it's in, what we obtain is a very high error. The root mean square error is very high. Why? Because the covariance matrix is very unstable. The inverse covariance matrix um, is, is, has exploded because the covariance matrix, uh, the renal covariance matrix, is uh, numerically ill conditioned. How about we um, shrink? The covariance matrix without denoising. Well, there is a there is a small improvement. It's not a it's not a very high improvement, but yes, applying a shrinkage helps, and that's great news. Um, uh, now, when we denoise the correlation matrix without a shrinkage, just denoising no shrinkage, there is a substantial reduction in the root mean square error, the reduction is, is around 60%. Think about it. 60% reduction in the estimation error from um, simply feeding Marchenko Pastor, separating the noise-related eigenvalues within, with the signal-related eigenvalues and centering the noise-related eigenvalues. It's a relatively straightforward operation that helps us reduce the root mean square error in the estimation of the efficient frontier by 60%. And when we combine the two, denoise and shrinkage, essentially we get the same improvement as denoise alone. So what this tells us is that shrinkage help us a little bit, much less than denoising, and in fact, denoising accomplishes all the reduction um, that the shrinkage accomplishes. So there is a, a perfect, essentially perfect overlap between the two. It's just that the noising is more effective. We know intuitively what's, what, what, what's the reason for that. The reason is that um, denoising accomplishes the same reduction in the variance of the inverse covariance matrix without losing information without losing signal. The shrinkage loses signal. Uh, that's the price you pay for uh, getting rid of the noise, while denoising gets rid of the noise while preserving all of the signal. So the result is intuitive. Is intuitive. Not only um, it, it can, be, can be replicated through Monte Carlo experiments, but we know why it's better. How about when we compute the maximum shot ratio portfolio? Well, when we compute the, max, the maximum shot ratio portfolio, the results are even uh, stronger. Why? Because if you remember from the second slide, um, computing the maximum shot ratio portfolio requires multiplying the inverse covariance matrix with the vector of expected returns. And where vector of expected returns is quite inaccurate, we cannot forecast returns with any confidence. And when we multiply that vector of expected returns with an exploded covariance matrix, well, it's just garbage in, garbage out. However, when we denoise the correlation matrix, now there is a substantial improvement. In fact, we are able to reduce the root mean square error by 94%. Now, um, having worked in finance for over 20 years, it is rather unusual to see, to find situations where a particular method can be so effective. A 94% reduction in root mean square error is, is very significant. And it tells us that this approach is, um, is very useful. Um, it, it can be very helpful. We are not talking about a minor improvement. We are talking about a rather radical improvement in the stability of the efficient frontier. Let's go now to the second source of instability. First, I refer to noise-induced instability. Noise-induced instability, if you remember, is related to the number of observations. That's why in the Marchenko-Pastor 
equations, we found that the range of the eigenvalues was a function of t over n, right? You remember from the equations, if t, um, if t over n is um, small, then the distribution widens. We need um, um, we need to have um, many observations for each variable that we uh, utilize in your in our analysis. How about signal induced instability? Where does it come from? How can signal be a source of instability? Uh, I think we all have in on the back of our minds the notion that signal cannot be bad. How could signal make our work difficult? That's precisely what we are trying to monetize, what we are trying to utilize. Well, as it happens, signal can be a problem too. And this is something that the literature, I don't think, has um, studied uh, enough. Uh, typically, most researchers focus on noise in this instability, and uh, very few researchers um, pay attention to signal induced stability. Let me motivate um, why signal induced stability is actually uh, very important. Consider the smallest um, system that you can think of, just two securities. Um, the correlation matrix could have this form, right? Uh, diagonals of ones and then uh, of diagonal elements of raw the correlation matrix between the two securities. We can diagonalize these uh, correlation matrix as C W equal W lambda, and where W, the matrix of eigenvectors, will have this form, and lambda, the matrix of eigenvalues, will have this form. As you can see, one of the eigenvalues will be one plus rho, and the other eigenvalue will be one minus rho. Now, as you know, the trace of the correlation matrix must be two, right? The sum of the uh, diagonal elements must be two, one plus one. But it, almost, it also must be equal to the sum of the eigenvalues. So we know for sure that lambda one plus lambda two must be equal to two. This means that when we have um, raw, uh, when, when we have a, um, one eigenvalue, that that grows, it can only grow at the expense of the other eigenvalue becoming a small, right? Um, in fact, we can see that also when we compute the uh, determinant of the correlation matrix, the determinant of the correlation matrix is going to be the product of the eigenvalues, and that's one plus rho uh, times one minus rho, uh, one minus rho square. What this means is the following. Um, we can only um, we can only increase one eigenvalue at the expense of reducing the other eigenvalue, and that will cause that the correlation matrix um, will be um, smaller. The determinant, sorry, the determinant of the correlation matrix will be smaller. This is problematic again because if the determinant um, becomes very small. Now the inverse covariance matrix will explode, and the entire solution will be very unstable. Now, why is this different from uh, noise-induced stability? Well, because we reach this conclusion without ever mentioning t or n. You see, we reach this conclusion, and we have never we we can reach this conclusion for any value t. So again. This source of instability is clearly different from noise-induced instability. It has nothing to do with t, the value, the number of observations. It has all to do with rho, the off-diagonal element. It has to do with the structure of the correlation matrix. We could use a correlation matrix computed on 10 billion observations, and if the rho is high, it means that one minus rho square uh, will make the, the determinant of the correlation matrix small. You see, it doesn't matter how many observations we utilize to estimate the correlation matrix. If the signal is such that um, rho, the off-diagonal elements are relatively high, 
then the the solution will be extremely unstable. So um, what does this mean in the case of Markovic? Well, why did we need Markovic in the in the first place? We we needed uh, Markovic's approach because we were dealing with a system of correlated securities. If the systems were if the system was uncorrelated, if the securities were not correlated to each other, the optimal solution would be just an inverse variance allocation, right? We would just allocate um, uh, money assets inversely proportional to the risk of the security, and that would be an optimal solution if all of the off diagonal elements are zero. So the reason we need Markovich is because we expect raw to be significantly greater than zero. And that is precisely the reason where Mark, that is precisely the situation where Markovich is supposed to fail. So let me state it clearly. The reason we need Markovich is the same reason that will cause Markovich to fail. So that's what I call Markovich's course. Unless we address signal induced instability, the very reason we need Markovich will be the same reason that Markovich will be defeated. How common is in finance to identify significant off diagonal elements? Well, it's extremely common. When you think of sectors, regions, these um, common, this shared, or I should say partially shared, these partially shared sources of risk mean that the financial, co financial correlation matrices tend to be clustered. They form clusters, where the clusters are either sectors, industries, countries, regions, etc. Companies that share the same suppliers, companies that share, share the same kind of investors or produce similar products, etc. The financial correlation metrics are highly clustered. And what, what does having clusters mean? Well, it means uh, significant off-diagonal elements. And these off-diagonal elements cannot be detoned, right? Because they are not shared. These sources of risk, this mutual information is not shared by all of the securities. It's shared by some securities. For instance, the securities that belong to the same sector. So detoning is not even an option. Um, what can we do? Well, we have to figure out a way to optimize this portfolio while controlling for signal induced instability. And this is what we are going to see now, the NCO algorithm. NCO stands for nested cluster optimization. The algorithm follows the following, uh, these five steps. Uh, step number one is um, correlation clustering. The first thing we need to do is we need to apply uh, clustering algorithms, whether uh, agglomerative or hierarchical, um, the algorithm of your choice. You can use the optimal number of cluster algorithms, the ONC algorithm, but you can uh, uh, apply other algorithms. The important is that now we are able to make a partition of our investment universe. The partition means that each um, security will belong to one and only one uh, cluster. Given that, the second step is that we are going to optimize each cluster separately. If we have K clusters, we will optimize um, um, clusters 1 to K separately. This, this task can be parallelized, can be solved very quickly. And each of these optimizations will take much less time than optimizing the overall portfolio. Why? Because the system is much, much smaller. The step number three is uh, system reduction. Now that we have estimated the optimal allocations for each cluster, we can reduce the system. Instead of working with an N by N system, where N is the number of securities, we can operate going forward with a K by K system, where K is the number of clusters. So in the, fourth, in the fourth step, we compute the inter-cluster allocation. We compute um, how much, how many assets 
should be allocated to each of the K clusters. Remember, in a step two, we computed the allocation intra cluster. In a step four, we compute the allocation inter cluster. What is the uh, solution? The solution is computed in uh, step five. That's the dot product of the two. We compute the, the dot product. Essentially, if we have allocated, let's say, 10% to one cluster, now this 10% will be sub allocated using the uh, uh, weights estimated in step two. Why does this method work? Well, very intuitively, it works because we have taken an ill posed problem and we have transformed it into a well behaved problem. Why? Because once we have reduced the system from n by n to k by k, now we are guaranteed that the off diagonal elements must be much smaller. Why are we guaranteed? Well, because that is the nature of clustering. The fact that all of these securities that belong to cluster one are bundled together is because they, they share uh, the same sources of risk. Their mutual information was very high. And now that we are compressing, right, now that we are collapsing um, all of that information into a single loading, the correlation between this cluster and other clusters must be smaller. If the correlation was high, then these two clusters should have merge. The, re the reason these two clusters did not merge means that their correlation must be low. Therefore, now the problem is well posed. The, now Markovich can truly succeed now that we have addressed the signal induced instability. By how much? How helpful is this approach? Well, we can repeat the same um, experiment that we applied earlier. We take a correlation matrix. In this case, I'm even taking a smaller correlation matrix. Uh, before we, you know, we experiment with a correlation matrix similar to the one uh, associated with the S&P, 500 securities, 10 blocks, one, one block per sector. In this case, the results are such that even with a very small correlation matrix like 50 by 50, we will see a significant improvement. Um, I won't go again through the description of the experiment. It's the same that we discussed before. The only difference is that now, instead of applying denoising, what we're going to do is we're going to apply uh, the nested cluster optimization algorithm. Well, the results are that um, if we're using a minimum variance portfolio, the reduction in the root mean square error is around 47%. Again, very significant. Interestingly, uh, applying a shrinkage is actually detrimental. Let me repeat this. When we shrink the correlation matrix and um, we uh, try to apply a minimum variance optimization, in this case, um, the, the solution will actually be worse. And why is that? Why is that? Well, because um, we know that uh, a shrinkage is going to lose information, and when it loses information, um, as a result, um, even though the, we have con control better for the noise, this loss of information leads to a worse solution. Uh, but what about um, combining both? NCO and a shrinkage. Well, again, that's worse than just applying NCO. And the reason again is that um, a shrinkage loses signal, and that's precisely what NCO is uh, trying to control for. Um, so this goes to say that uh, it is not even true that uh, a shrinkage always helps, even if not much. In some cases, a shrinkage can actually be detrimental. How about um, um, computing the maximum sharp ratio portfolio? Essentially the same results. There is a, an improvement of 55% um, um, when you use NCO relative to applying uh, Markovich. Let me finalize with some thoughts about uh, robust analysis. Robustness 
uh, analysis via Monte Carlo. Um, I referred earlier that um, historical backtesting is not particularly effective or useful when we are trying to evaluate the mathematical properties of a particular algorithm. The information is, is that we are going to extract is essentially anecdotal. Uh, a better approach is Monte Carlo. Now, we can repeat this kind of procedure to evaluate multiple algorithms, not only Markovic, and NCO, but 20, 50 different algorithms on a particular input. On, for instance, the input could be um, the Barra uh, factor covariance matrix and see what procedure is better for this particular input. So what I'm saying is that um, even though I like NCO uh, very much as an algorithm, that doesn't mean that NCO will necessarily be the best option always. Depending on the kind of uh, signal and noise that is contained in our input variables, there could be better algorithms to deal with these inputs. And how can we discover what algorithm is better for a particular problem? How can we identify what is the best tool for this job? And that's where Monte Carlo optimization selection helps. The steps are the following. First, we compute some input set or we get the input set, for instance, from your favorite provider. And then we're going to produce a random draws uh, that lead to, um, uh, estimate, to, to sample inputs, sample new, sam sample, um, sample B. Um, based on that we can compute optimal allocations and we can do that for 20 50 different optimization algorithms where we are going to evaluate given these input variables what is the solution that leads to the lowest root mean square error so what i'm saying is that rather than expecting that there will be some algorithm that will dominate always i would like that people are more experimental they identify what is the particular tool for this set. And in that way, um, we don't need just to apply one method. We will have all of these algorithms in our toolbox and we will apply the right tool for each job. Well, if you like um, this presentation and ideas that I discussed, um, I recommend you that um, you take a look at um, my two most recent books one of them is this one advances in financial machine learning and also uh, the the newest one that came from uh, cambridge university press uh, machine learning for asset managers where you can find uh, a lot of the code and the, the a detailed explanation of what i have just discussed and with that vincent this is the time for questions thank you very much Awesome. Thank you very much, Marcos. Um, so we've got a few questions from the audience. Um, and before I quickly go to those, I'll just um, give people another chance to send over some last minute questions if they have any once they've seen the presentation. Um, but so the first one that was asked was, does the empirical matrix need to be column centered? Um, the, the empirical covariance matrix um, needs to be uh, the typical covariance matrix you compute. So you you um, uh, take a vector of vector of expected uh, returns. They can be relative to a benchmark or not, and you compute the covariance matrix. That's the only requirement. Uh, it's, it will be a, um, a covariance matrix that is positive definite, um, but the approach is as general as that. Okay. Um, and next one so from OMT, the estimate of the largest eigenvalue is based upwards. Should that be taken into account in the convariance and correlation metrics estimate? And if so, how? And how would this bias affect detoning and be incorporated into detoning? Great question. So let me bring this slide, which is the relevant one. As you can see here, um, we, com we compute a um, uh, the eigenvalues associated with the uh, correlation matrix. And we know that theoretically, given Marchenko-Pastor, this is the highest 
eigenvalue that we expect from a random covariance matrix. And this is the, the smallest eigenvalue that we expect from a random covariance matrix. This is if the random covariance matrix is, if the covariance matrix is random. But of course, covariance matrices in finance are not random. They contain noise, they contain a lot of noise, but they also contain some signal. That's why we need to estimate, we need to fit the marchenko pastor distribution. And that's what gives us the, this value lambda plus and this value lambda minus. So uh, to answer directly the question, um, yes, there will be a, a maximum eigenvalue that we are estimating from our empirical cor correlation matrix, but that is not lambda plus. That is very likely the, eigenvalue, the, the strongest eigenvalue, which is related to signal. What we need to compute is what is the highest eigenvalue associated with noise. And that's the one that we use to separate the two eigenvalues. And to, to fit this distribution, the marchenko pastor distribution, we need to use machine learning, in particular kernel density estimation. Great. Um, and then I think a similar question, next one. Uh, what percent of the number of eigenvalues is a good rule of thumb to denoise without denoising? Example, removing too much signal. Great question. Well, I think that at least we are talking about one. Um, when, when you think of the market component, uh, that's the one that needs to be removed. Uh, empirically, um, you can determine how many you need. Well, it will be, uh, you can keep removing eigenvalues until you, you get um, a good clustering, until you get clustering with a very high t-value of the silhouette score. So experimentally, you can determine how many uh, eigenvalues need to be detoned. Um, how many? Well, how, how many, you, whatever number you need to obtain a, a very high quality clustering. Oh. Okay, bear with me with the next one. Now I'm going to do my best to try and read it out. Uh, Marchenko Pastor PDF holds up, holds in the limiting case when nt is equal more than m for a fixed ratio. For the finite case, especially when the asset universe is small, uh, 100 stocks, one can find the empirical equivalent MP spectral distribution that lack a sharp cutoff point. Can it be more effective to denoise using a cutoff from the empirical finite MP PDF? rather than the SM.MP PDF? That's a wonderful question. Um, you, you, are, you are perfectly right. Um, when we are talking about the very small um, uh, covariance matrices, like the one I used in the second example, that's why in particular I wanted to present an example with just 50 uh, entries. Um, in that case, uh, Marcinko Pastor may not be um, the, the most effective way. I still think that it would be much better than applying a shrinkage. Um, we could test that, by the way, uh, using Monte Carlo. Uh, but uh, there are other approaches that you can use in that case. In fact, there is a, a, a paper um, that presents an heuristic. Maybe, maybe I can give you the actual. Yeah, there is a paper by uh, Cockeret and Milo 2014, um, we will put this paper in the, um, with the slides um, that using an heuristic to determine the, the cutoff um, uh, point. I mean, an heuristic may be here uh, the wrong term. Uh, it, is, it is essentially a rule of thumb, um, but that it is well informed, it's well motivated, it's not arbitrary. And, and that seems to be uh, quite useful when we are dealing with um, a small covariance matrices like you know 50 or or um, nearly a hundred uh, variables. Great, a um, couple more. So um, one additional problem with MO is that it produces non-sparse portfolios, effectively ignoring transition costs. Can NCO be adjusted to produce sparse portfolios, say with using ICA rather than PCA, that take into account the cost of acquiring a position? Absolutely, and that is why I like Mark. Uh, that's why I like Monte Carlo approaches. You can simulate your experiment. You can design your experiment in the way you want it. It's under our control, and uh, we can see whether adding now some transaction costs to this particular kind of covariance matrix helps. So. 
your question is an excellent question because it it, it glides really well to what towards um, what I said at the end of the presentation. Right? We need to be more experimental in finance. I think that we need to um, abandon this notion that there are some mathematical methods that will always be better, that will always dominate. Uh, we have to kind of abandon this sort of axiomatic uh, mindset that we have in finance. We need to use math, of course, but we have to understand that uh, math is a, uh, uh, math, uh, finance is a very complex system and we need to identify what is the best tool for each job. And so on a similar mode, uh, have you experienced with different distributions heavier tailed for your simulations? Yes. Uh, in fact, um, um, there are um, some very interesting contributions uh, made by uh, Gautier Marti. He has applied uh, GAN uh, uh, methods to produce um, uh, complex uh, covariance matrices. And again, um, please do not take this presentation as a claim that there will be a mathematical approach that will always dominate. I believe that's wrong. Uh, for each problem, you need to identify the right solution. NCO happens to be a very good approach for the kind of covariance matrices that we uh, that uh, can utilize from Barra, for instance. But there will be some products, I don't know, maybe energy commodities uh, that will exhibit some traits um, that will require different tools. And that's where the Monte Carlo uh, um, approach that I discussed at the end of the presentation comes helpful. Perfect. Um, and so final two questions in case anyone else wants to submit. Um, we've still got a few minutes left. Um, penultimate one, what are the residue improvements of cluster size as a parameter versus RMSC in your final table? Yes, so look, I, I like um, ONC. ONC um, is an approach that uh, allows you to uh, recover the number of clusters in a particular system. And again, Monte Carlo experiments show that it does so quite effectively. But depending on the size of the problem and uh, and also depending on the characteristics of the covariance matrix, you may want to use other approaches. I happen to like ONC a lot, but from time to time, I also use um, other methods. Like, uh, for instance, if I'm dealing with an extremely large covariance matrix and I need to compute a solution within minutes and I don't have um, the patience or the time or the computing power to uh, apply ONC, which is quite a computationally expensive, what I may do is to apply a hierarchical classing algorithm where I control for the, uh, I mean, I, I um, evaluate the T value of the silhouette score and find a cutoff. You know, this is an operation that even if we said 10,000 by 10,000 covariance matrix can be accomplished within minutes. ONC will take hours, and uh, if you don't have hours, then you apply that approach, and and guess what? It, it comes, it comes. The answer quite uh, quite um, approximate. It's, it's a good approximation. So um, there are many different clustering methods in the literature that apply apply different linkage. Uh, uh, functions and um, it, it, please be open-minded. You don't need to use what I have just discussed. Uh, in fact, I'm a, um, uh, I believe that uh, the more methods you explore, the bigger will be your toolkit. Perfect. Um, and then final questions before we round up then, more from a general sense then, what would you say needs to happen for firms to modernize and what are the current obstacles? Yes, um, there are two kinds of obstacles. Number one is, um, um, like in many uh, fields in finance, there are uh, generational biases and, and legacy methods. So Markovich has been used for 60 years and will continue to be used, even though everybody recognizes all of the problems and limitations with Markovich. This is just uh, how the industry is set up. Um, 
Um, and um, uh, now, over time, I believe that uh, those legacy methods will disappear as people retire, <laughs> um, and new methods will be will become uh, prevalent. I think that uh, what this tells you is that there is an opportunity here for those firms that embrace the new methods. They will have an edge, and even if that edge is not uh, staggering. That's all you need in finance, right? In finance, a very small edge actually means the, the entire difference between success and failure. So um, I think that we are in a very interesting moment in finance because on one hand, we have more computing power than ever. We have better and bigger data sets than ever, uh, which combined with machine learning gives us an edge and um, the legacy methods are typically favored by very large asset managers, which means that there is a lot of alpha to be extracted. Mm. I would say that there is today more alpha to be monetized than ever before because uh, the industry has consolidated into a very few extremely large asset managers that utilize legacy methods and then many um, very small firms that are more dynamic, more effective, uh, more modern, and as a result, there is an abundance of alpha that didn't exist before when the uh, industry was uh, much more uniform. Well, well, fantastic way to, to finish off the presentation. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we've got no more questions. We've got one comment, though, saying um, kudos for a great presentation. Um, and I'm sure the rest of our attendees could um, echo that as well. So, yeah, thank you very much for, for your time, Marcos. And, yeah, thank you to our audience as well for, for participating. So, My absolute pleasure. And please stay safe. Awesome. So thank you all for joining us um, today. Um, if you did enjoy the webinar, please head over to Quantmind's LinkedIn page and let us know in the poll. Um, and while you're there, you're more than welcome to stay connected with us. You can either follow us on LinkedIn or, or on Twitter at Quantmind's um, for all the latest updates on our face-to-face -face and online events, including webinars. Um, our next one will be tomorrow with Alexandre Antonov, um, and we hope you'll be able